right we've got we've got 53 people so far so I'm, i think that's enough to be getting on with so i'm going to kick off the proceedings today um we're probably going to have a few more join during the during the introduction so um that that's fine i think we just need to get a move on because we've got a fantastic agenda today and we've got quite a lot of um quite a lot to cover um can i just please check before we get started that you've all got your microphones on mute except for if you're speaking obviously so uh just to just to sort of reduce any noise interference um today we're looking at the uh challenge of meeting the net zero target in the nhs but as you're here today it's much more than just the environmental considerations we're looking at there'd be self-care social value reducing waste and efficiency so uh we'll be covering all those sorts of topics so wide ranging wide range of debate, I think, and hopefully uh, interesting for all. Uh, this is the second uh, knowledge sharing seminar that we've organised in a series. Um, and these events are much more than just uh, the seminar itself. We're hoping to build a bit of a network. So could I ask you if, if you if you could share your job titles um, and your organisation in the chat and then you can you can start to make those networks beyond on this event today. Uh, talking about names and job titles, my name's Terry Huff and I'm uh, Productivity Lead for AGEM and I'll be uh, chairing the event today, try to keep everybody to time uh, so we can leave plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. And uh, if you could just, uh, as we're going along, ju just put your questions and, and points in the, in the chat box and we'll try and capture as much as we can at the end of the session. Given we've got, I think we're up to 64 people now, I imagine we're going to have far too many questions to answer everything today, but don't worry, we're going to get our panel of speakers to answer as much as they can and then uh, circulate that after. We'll also be circulating a copy of the uh, a video of this so we can uh, we can recycle recycle the video, which I think is quite apt given, given the topic of discussion today. Uh, and Kirsty, have you put um, a link in the chat to the futures futures website? Kirsty, I'll do that now. I'll yeah, that'd be, that yeah, I think most of you are already members of this Social Value Futures website. But if you're not, please please do uh, do join. You can keep up to date with the latest news, future events, and also, as I said, make those connections. Uh, via this network, so I think that's going to be a really, really useful part of today. is about is about helping each other uh, to uh, to address what is going to be a significant change over over the next few years. Right, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I'm going to hand you over to Stella, who's our first um, first speaker today. I'll let Stella Stella introduce herself. Thanks, Terry. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, really good to be here. Um, so I've got the, the opening uh, slot, the opening pleasure, really. Um, I'm going to try and set a bit of context, really. Um, I work in the east of England. I'm in the Greener NHS team, so work closely with OICB leads and sustainability leads in trust in iPatch. And the focus really is all about this kind of moving us towards net zero and a more sustainable healthcare. And hopefully what I'm going to share with you today is my kind of route map to that. How I think we get there is we need to change the way we see things in order to change the healthcare we see. Thank you, if you could move the slide. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, five things I wanna to talk to you about today, this morning, or this afternoon even. First of all, kind of unpacking, understanding the issue really, the, the scale of the challenge and what the nature of that challenge is. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our kind of how carbon is locked into our behaviours and our practices and the circular economy approach and how that can be really helpful for us. And understanding the ask, when we use the word sustainability, it means lots of different things to different people. And the NHS Net Zero report is obviously about carbon. It is about carbon reduction, but it is much more than that. And getting our head around that shift from sickness response system as a healthcare system into that kind of promotion of health and well-being is, is a big part of, of the ask in order for us to get to a net zero healthcare system. I'll then share a few things in terms of the, the trouble with carbon. Um, it, it is really difficult to picture and it is kind of entrenched over many years. We, we didn't get here overnight and it would take us a little while to unpack 
our um, behaviours and our practices. And then share a few thoughts really around what we can do positively in terms of reframing that around a, a greener lens and how we kind of spread that accountability across the system. And then lastly, and hopefully this will sort of link in as well to some of the other speakers that are going to talk to you um, later, but really taking more of a kind of how do we bed this in to our normal way of working rather than thinking of this as a programme. It's not an initiative, it's not a project, it's not short term. It's more about embedding it in the core of what we do. Uh, and hopefully I'll share with you how I think commissioning is 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 key to that process. Thank you. Next slide. So understanding the issue, uh, current norms, values and practices in the circular economy. Thank you. So I don't know if anybody uh, has the same recollection. I might be showing my age here from from GCSE English, but um, there used to be this this poem that was read out kind of a uh, fairly weak, frequently in my class. But for me, it sums up the challenge of where we're at. And that challenge, I'm not going to read all the way through that pro that poem, but that challenge is in a sense is our opportunity is about everybody leaning into the challenge of making sustainable healthcare. And the danger is that people look around and think, oh, that's not my job. It's not in my job title. I've not been given that specific brief. Someone else is going to pick that up. It's really important. Someone else will will, will have a handle on that. But ultimately, the challenge for us is that nobody does anything because everybody thinks that somebody else will. And we can all get quite angry about that. So for me, the first sort of takeaway is we all have to lean into this. It has to be about everybody in the system doing their, their piece, irrespective of what role they, they do. Some will have clinical roles, some won't, but we can all make um, steps towards that sustainable healthcare system. Thank you. So what are we trying to make an impact on? Uh, for me, understanding that the, the challenge is it's really around decision making. When we think about what essentially describes a sustainable healthcare system, it would be that every decision that is made by every single person operating in that decision would bring those three factors to bear in that decision making. So the environmental impact, the economic impact and the social would kind of be in more balance than they are currently. So as a healthcare system, obviously, we think about patient outcomes and patient need, and we're quite driven by that social aspect. We're not always as good at looking at that wider community population picture um, and some of the ways that we can be um, supporting the wider determinants of health in the way we make decisions, because that's not maybe kind of how, how the NHS has been framed. Becky will talk a little bit about wider social value Finance, we all live with that kind of constant pressure of making decisions within a limited financial um, uh, envelope. But that environmental voice is often kind of second, third, fourth. It's very quiet. We're not really bringing that to bear in our decision making. Thank you. Next slide. So if we get our decision making right, one of the other things that we need to understand is the kind of framing of our current uh, economy and the model that we work in. So uh, we describe this as linear model, high cost, high waste. Uh, I would define that if we think about public sector over the last few years, we've thought about how we can bring products in as cheap as we can that are fit for purpose. And we focus a lot on what we do with them while they're in the system with us. And we probably don't give them very much thought at the point we finish using it. We put it in the bin. If we're really good, we put it in the right bin or maybe we don't um, and we then don't really think about what happens to it afterwards. So this kind of model of um, uh, kind of in and out, uh, buy it cheap, you know, kind of use it once, buy again, that kind of uh, attitude and culture is one um, that makes it really difficult for us to, to tackle the carbon. Next slide, please. So where we want to get to is a more circular economy model. So, uh, you know, that's typified by the fact that we retain the value of things uh, for much longer, that we, we actually really think about where they've come from. We think about how we can maximise uh, the use of it. So whether that's kind of reusable items, whether that's repurposing, whether that's recycling, but we are looking at how do we retain the value. So obviously that's good for uh, kind of efficiency as well. And when we think about cost, we don't think about how much did it buy me, how much did it cost me to buy this product in. We think about the, the, the whole cost, the true cost, the kind of personal cost to those that are involved in that manufacturing, i.e. picking up things like modern slavery. But we, but we think about what's the cost uh, while I'm using this product and the cost of waste. 
so many of us would have no idea really which, <coughs> uh, you know what the cost of waste is coming out of our our hospitals or our um our, our systems that we're working in uh, but you, we would have more of a kind of focus on that in a in a cult in a circular economy culture and that zero tolerance really to any kind of waste whether that be time energy water uh, or travel thanks next slide so um context for this really when we think about sustainable health care for me that's really about it's about population health it's about moving a shift away from just thinking about the patient that's in front of us and thinking about everything that we're doing and how that impacts on a community and on that can pre prevention of ill health um, and the wider determinants of health um, and you can see on the right hand side I've kind of you know stolen an image actually from one of our trust um, Cambridge University um, Adam Brooks uh, but you know, those various things that impact on health as a result of climate change. It is about improving our resilience to that and our effectiveness and, um, you know, ensuring that we're reducing the demand for healthcare services over time rather than kind of exasperating some of our, um, you know, current um, conditions that we see amongst our population. Thank you. Next slide. So a little bit about understanding the ask and what 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 the net zero um, kind of targets from an NHS point of view uh, look like. Thank you. Next slide. So I have to kind of start with the legislative. There is a requirement on us, uh, a legal requirement for us to consider the Climate Change Act and the Environmental Act, and that is placed on all trusts and ICBs. And in a way, when it talks about consider um, those two acts, for me, that's about where it drops into the, well, how does that impact on our decision making? At what point are we actually considering that? Do our processes and our procedures support us to do that? Or is that like an afterthought that we're kind of expecting people will have this act in the back of their minds when they're going about their daily job? Thank you. Next slide. I've tried to take what is a really comprehensive and really well thought out um, document, the NHS Net Zero report, and in a way try and simplify that on a slide uh, in the way that I think about it. Um, this journey to transforming the NHS for me sits in these four big buckets, really, in terms of the things that we need to focus on. Uh, and bucket number one really is around the commissioning and enabling sustainable models of care, because the commissioning process is where we set out our expectation of what good looks like, of what quality looks like, about what the outcomes are that we're looking for. And within the way that we do that commissioning process, the sustainable lens looks at you know, digital, it looks at what travel we're requiring in terms of where we're putting those services. It looks at, could we prevent any of that ill health? What can we do to kind of mitigate, repeat, um, uh, you know, patients coming back with the same issues? But it also looks at productivity and, you know, inefficiency and, and duplication. And we would also home in in some of our kind of real hotspot areas around plastics, single use plastics and reusable PPE. So how we frame the, what it is that we're trying to deliver is the starting point. And that kind of sets the baton for what our procurement teams can then do in terms of where they're purchasing products from and whether or not those suppliers are sustainable in their practices, but also the actual products themselves. How do we begin to understand which things are lower carbon, which things are, are better for the environment? And not only having understood that, it's not, it's, not, it's not acceptable just for our procurement teams or NHS supply chain to understand that. We have to get that information to the consumers that are making those decisions about which products you use and which things you pick off the framework lists. The third big bucket is the one that's always a bit uncomfortable in a capitalist uh, system, really, because in a way, carbon is everywhere. And the more we consume, the more carbon we create. So actually, the kind of reducing, just generally just not using as much, thinking about do we really need it, is the single biggest thing we can all do. And then where we have used it, thinking about that, how do I reduce the waste? Can I, can I, could I have gone with a, a reusable option? Can I dispose of this in a better way that will retain that value for longer? And then the third bucket, fourth bucket rather, sorry, uh, a big one, a challenging area, particularly when we haven't got necessarily the funding that we would like, is decarboning our, decarbonising our estates and electrifying our fleet and looking at the sources of our energy, because obviously that kind of is, is entwined within our sustainable um, healthcare pathways um, and is a big, big area of focus. Thank you. Next slide. So it's not just about carbon. We talk a lot about carbon. Um, but all the greenhouse gases come in scope and you'll see the others mentioned there. We have a big focus on nitrous oxide 
um, and the F gases because of their potency uh, and their equivalent to the carbon dioxide. So, you know, they might be small, but that's why we focus on things like inhalers um, uh, and uh, anaesthetic gases, because uh, although they're used in smaller quantity more generally than the carbon, they are so um, highly potent. Thank you. Next slide. But the bigger picture, and I'm not going to talk about this too much because I think Becky will have lots to say about this, really, is sustainable healthcare isn't just about carbon, it is in that wider social value. And this diagram that's taken from the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare is kind of mapping out that triple bottom line. So as a healthcare system, it's in our interest to reduce carbon because increased carbon in the air uh, just leads to increased health issues, which we then pick up the tab for the other end. So this is about uh kind of improving the wider determinants of health trying to get those communities to be as as, as active in terms of their travel you know uh, eating good diets and kind of being healthily engaged as well as managing the ultimate costs that will come back to us in the future thank you next slide so the other big kind of agenda that sits within this sustainable healthcare that I think often gets lost, we're focused, it's easy to focus inwards on, on that on that net zero report, you know, quite rightly it gets us to think about our direct emissions, our scope one and two, and also to think about our supply chain. But actually, you know, we are the biggest employer. If every single one of our members of staff took a changed view about sustainability and the things that we can do in our own lives and talked about that amongst their friends, their colleagues, their touch points. It's also about our, our ability to influence the wider population and, and behaviour, wider consumer patterns, as well as obviously we have got a huge supply chain um, and we are doing what we can to kind of get them on board and get them on the on the same journey. But, you know, there's that influencing big public sector role as an anchor organisation. Thank you. Next slide. So the trouble with carbon. Um, yeah, I'll talk to you a little bit about how, how difficult it is for us to kind of really unpick this. Thank you. Next slide. So first challenge with carbon, apart from the fact it's really difficult to picture. So hence I've put another image on here just to kind of get things in perspective in terms of personal carbon footprint, a kind of typical household and what a trust level uh, carbon footprint looks like. But big challenge with it apart from the fact we can't visualize it so we often forget about it because we can't see it um once it's up in the atmosphere it, it sticks around for a long while so actually not only do we feel the impact of um uh, you know the things that we're doing today but we will also bear that impact of what we've done years before it's not it's not quite as simple as just saying if we just suddenly get to grip and we we kind of live a different lifestyle the problem will go away because that carbon is already in the atmosphere and the focus is all about, you know, reducing um, the, the level of carbon in order to avoid this kind of tipping point around the 1.5 percent, which tips the climate emergency, which I have to say we are heading head, heading towards. So it's all about mitigating that and, and keeping that as low as we possibly can. Next slide. Two minutes, Stella. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on, on this, but really that the carbon is locked in to our healthcare systems. And I wanted to just kind of share with you a bit of a diagram that would would pick that out. Um, but it's it's kind of locked in in the way that we phrase our goals and ambitions. So if you look at that uh, uh, diagram there in terms of organisational procedures, imagine if we had a default system that said you use reusable items. If you want to use single use, you kind of have to make that clinical exception for that. Just actually sometimes in the way that we frame uh, the goals drives the behaviour and the activities and the policies. And we have seen that where we've had national changes. So the ban on desflurane, we saw massive movement. Um, we get funding pots that kick in, whether that be uh, a kind of positive funding for lead lighting, which encourages people to, to take up those opportunities, or whether that's about um, penalties. So the civil penalties around the emission trading scheme where our hospitals have to pay uh, are fine if their um, boilers and things are basically emitting more carbon than than the uh, capping level. But that kind of, for me, the key bit is around the organisational procedures which trigger those behavioural responses. And Andrew's going to talk a little bit more about sustainability, sustainability impact assessments and how they can be really useful in driving some of that sustainable decision making um, and, you know, ensuring that we have that 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 kind of ongoing behaviour and triggering that behavioural response is really key. Thank you. Next slide. So developing the greener lens. Yeah, if you can just flick on to the next one, conscious of time, Terry. Um, so changing our goals and our narrative, 
thinking about how we align the story that we talk about sustainable healthcare. It's not something separate to all the other things that we do. It is about reducing air pollution to tackle childhood asthma or to improve obesity. It, it isn't just about carbon per se. It is about thinking about if we don't actually lean into this, what does it look like when we start to experience more extreme weather, flooding, uh, and how that impacts on poor mental health? You know, East of England was the had the most uh, flood flooded sites, uh, I think, in the last two years, actually. Um, but also thinking about how how we reframe how we talk about it so that it feels like it's part of everybody's job, not that something is separate. Thanks. Next slide. And then the quality improvement framework, I think, is really key. If we embed sustainable healthcare again as part of our frame of reference, and that's how we determine quality and we pull it through the quality improvement process, we will be running through those sustainable models of care, looking for the opportunities of how we can make that, uh, you know, uh, uh, improve that in terms of its carbon and the wider social value. Thank you. Next slide. So key bit for me. Um, it is about designing it in, not bolting it on. It shouldn't be an afterthought. We don't think about that in, uh, in terms of, you know, a safe practices, inclusive practices, equality and diversity. We, we see that as part of how we do business. And that's how we need to approach uh, the kind of greener agenda. Next slide, please. And for me, the core bit here to focus on is that importance of getting it right at the commissioning stage. So ICBs are strategic commissioners of healthcare. And they were set up really to support those four core purposes, improving outcomes in population health, tackling health inequalities, enhancing productivity and value for money and supporting broader social and economic uh, development. That is the core of what a sustainable healthcare system is. Those four core purposes are exactly what sustainable healthcare system is. So for me, it is about um, embedding it in and getting it on at the beginning. Last slide, please. Hopefully I've stuck to time, Terry, but really just a recap, and I've got my phraseology wrong here in my, my attempt to, to type quickly, but change the way you see healthcare and how you determine what is and isn't a quality um, uh, delivery. And that will give you opportunities to think about how could I do this in a different way and with the right tools around sustainability impact assessments business cases and some of our behaviour change tools that we, we see in the system with the right support people can then actually make a difference but it starts with accepting that shared accountability and being prepared to change the way we look at the system and what good looks like um, and then you know engage with some of those tools that we're developing as net zero teams thank Thanks, you Stella. Terry that's been that's been great that's a great uh, great context I think for the whole whole of the uh, afternoon today so that's really Really helpful, and I think it just emphasised the fact that it's much it's much more than just uh, environmental issues we're looking at here. Um, I think Alice, I think we're changing agenda. Out. Alice, are you are you up next? Um, I don't think so. I think I'm just in front oh, it's of Andrew. Becky. Yes, Andrew, yeah. there you are. Sorry. I think I'm on next, Terry. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. If you want to introduce yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, everyone. Um, so my name is Andrew Urquhart. I'm sustainability lead for Suffolk and North East Essex. I am currently in a cloakroom in a conference that I'm due to speak at this afternoon. So if it's noisy, I do apologise. Um, and what I want to do really is talk to you about embedding sustainability in BAU. There are lots of tools, there are lots of different approaches, but I'm going to share with you something we've been developing that I honestly think is probably the most important piece of work we'll do in this green plan cycle. I'm absolutely convinced of it. So delighted to share it with you all today. Um, and uh, just as an aside, linking into what Stella had said, my job title, sustainability lead, purpose of job, reduce the impacts of climate change on population health. So really holistic thinking. This is not about saving the planet. This is about saving us. And I get my eco warrior tick points afterwards. So if I could next slide, please. So let's start with something a bit dry. I'm going to talk to you about a sustainability impact assessment. What is it? Well, I don't know if you can read that on the right hand side, but an SIA for short is an approach for exploring the combined economic, environmental and social impacts. Think back to that slide that Stella showed you on a range of proposed policies, programs, strategies, action plans. So this relates to everything, not a bolt on, not an afterthought. How do we embed it? And these assessments, the second bit, 
can also assist in your decision making and your strategic planning throughout your entire policy cycle. So you can keep using, referring back, re-evaluating it, leaning into it. So that's what an SIA is. And there are lots of different models and lots of different approaches. And I'm just going to talk to you about the one that we've developed in Suffolk and North East Essex today. So why do we do it? Well, we want to improve population health outcomes and, and, and Stella's outlined that already and, 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 and Becky's going to talk about that in a little while. And that's delivering that wider social value. And Becky's going to talk about that as well. So I'm in the interest of time. I'm not going to rattle through it, but there are five elements to the social value model which are helpful, but also somewhat a bit too prescriptive as well. And I'll, I'll come on to that in a little while. At worst case scenario and just getting compliance, this helps us implement the mandated ask that Stella's outlined in the Health and Care Act, environmental protection, climate resilience, social value and reducing our carbon emissions. That's all locked in. So at worst, because compliance is the worst case, the best case is you want to be on front foot and really making a difference. So our approach is different to some of the other systems. There are some fantastic um, SIAs out there to use, but we felt that they were a bit too prescriptive too soon. And people certainly what came out of our pilot project that I'll share with you already want to leap to the metric. And actually our approach here is to put ourselves in a child's shoes. And what does a child always ask you? How come? Why? Why does that happen? They're not focused on that destination and that metric and that answer. This is a journey. So we're adopting the four principles of sustainable models of care, prevention, patient self-care, being lean and delivering lower carbon alternatives. The best lowest carbon reduction measure that we can all do is prevention. If you prevent it happening in the first place, you're not creating the carbon. And 25% of the NHS's carbon footprint is associated with medicines. So there's a real um, synergy there. So we're achieving this. We hope this is the start of the process, um, integrating into uh, service design, into um, commissioning, procurement, contract management. So getting it in at the beginning, the specification, have we thought it through? And it's a stop and reflect moment. It's definitely for us is not a tick box exercise. Certainly in our transformation teams, they have to do an awful lot of assessments and impact assessments. But this one is we'll identify something, we'll embed it and we'll take it through the process. We're not going to tick a box to say we comply, then we move on. This is about really trying to embed these principles into what we do. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to just talk to you a few um, a bit about the pilot itself. We, we started off um, with a simple two questions, which had a lot less detail in and about a page and a bit of guidance. Have you thought about A, B, C, D? As we rolled this pilot out from like March 2023, we engaged with every person that completed it. One to one, what do you think? And we iteratively amended and kept building on it as we went through that pilot process. And then at the end of the pilot process, we had a focus group and the focus group came together and absolutely pulled apart what we'd, what we'd created and we put it back together. Am I back in the room? You are back now. I thought you disappeared <laughs> behind the coach there. <laughs> <laughs> Great, isn't it? It's like live TV of a certain age, but never mind. I was going to go back Blue Peter, but I won't. So um, anyway, so look, the, the SIA itself is a conversation starting with prompt. It is that line in the sand, stop, Kit Kat, whatever. Don't just charge forward, have a think. So we put a snapshot guide in at the front. And that links all of the issues that Stella and Becky and others are going to talk about today. Seven and a half to 10 minute read. We outline social value, the ICB responsibilities, the steps we want people to do to complete it. And then we've split two very prescriptive and high level social value questions, one environmental, one non-environmental. And then there's a series of guides and prompts behind figured around domains where the hotspots are so that people can go to it. Think, where is the carbon hotspot? I, use um, our be well bus as an example the be well bus is we've um, got a coach for a year and we're taking care out into the community well if you're driving a coach around suffolk and northeast essex you're automatically creating carbon we've got an issue we've identified that issue then we can start to do something about what can we mitigate 
And then the other element of that is there is tremendous social value through taking that bus out. So although there's a negative carbon impact that we can start to mitigate against, there's a huge social positive in terms of health and well-being, community engagement, community integration, access to service, the list goes on and on. So this is what this is. This makes you stop, think, pros, cons, right, what can we do about it? And then we put some example responses in there and some other links to useful information. So next slide, please. I'm going to start rattling on from in the spirit of time. Um, Stella's already talked about the four models of sustainable care, prevention, patient self-care, lean and, and lower carbon. So I, I won't dwell on them, but just to give you an example of those four elements and how they might help. So prevention and patient self-care reduces medicines use, 25% of the NHS's carbon footprint, reduces travel, 14% of the NHS's carbon footprint, reduces emissions to support patient throughput, lean and helps to tackle inequality by getting to the nub of some of the issues that underpin them and then lean and lower carbon if you're reducing waste walking aid reuse for instance um, that's going to help that's a lower carbon alternative and that mm -hmm. every bit of equipment it's a reusable tourniquet a reusable um, catheter or whatever it may be if it's a lower carbon alternative you can potentially save money um, in doing so so next slide please OK, um, this is the front cover of or the second cover on the uh, the snapshot guide, and um, you can see that we've got the UN Sustainable Development Goals there and we've got the wider determinants of health on the right hand side and we link them through. It's like a story tale. Now, we added this in at the beginning and we've written it in such a way that it can be sliced off and used as an extra guide. Why did we do that? Because our staff, when they went through the pilot, we realised there is a significant knowledge gap. Everyone's learning. This is carbon and health is really new for most of our staff. So we wanted to get it into an area that they can understand it. When we originally designed the SIA, we had links back to our green plan. It was obvious once they started working through it to have to keep flicking back to the relevant green plan page and back and forth wasn't viable. So we put this in at, at the front. We know it's complex. And we wanted to make it really relevant. So that's why that guides in at the beginning and we wanted to make it visual, quick, easy to understand narrative. And that's been really well received by our staff. Uh, next slide, please. You've seen this already, and I suspect you're going to see it again before the end of this session. But, you know, we're trying to create sustainable value. Those triple bottom line benefits, outcomes of patients and population health. So we follow that mantra. There is a page um, shamelessly extracted from work that the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare have done with us in terms of training our board. Um, and this is taken from that. We follow the social value narrative because that's what the government guidance says. So at least if people follow back through the legislation, everything that sits behind it, they can see that we're following a narrative. Why? What came out of the pilot was people have a notion of social value and what that might be, and they kind of understand it, although lots of different interpretations. What they don't necessarily get yet is the links between the two and environment. People see them as separate and swimming with the tide. There's no point trying to reinvent the wheel. We'll just keep the two separate questions and it's easier. And this also um, mirrors, like I said, leadership training that we've that we've we've given. And uh, next slide, please. Two minutes, Andrew. OK, I'm going to rattle through these. I'm not going to go through these questions. There's an environmental question, a non environmental question. The environmental question has the carbon hotspots and carbon is mandatory non-environmental question basically we've gone through the social value model put in the headlines and added an extra couple of sections on there we are framing that as a free up down and desired outcome and narrative why because the staff wanted it the staff shaped this this is what they're looking for what they're asking for the only other point i want to make here is this sia sits behind a commissioning pack that's been done these two standard questions you see here are part of the commissioning pack this sits behind it and also for lower level um, procurements, staff are able to use these generic questions rather than something that's bespoke. So we're getting some consistency across the board. Next slide, please. Um, no need to say anything on that, except that just what some of the guidance looks like. And you can see there, care model is the first thing. First question, will it promote, prevent, empowerment, healthy behaviours, emotional well-being. 
the staff look at the hotspot, they go for a series of review questions, they start to think, will it, won't it, could it count it? That's all I'll say there. Uh, next slide, please. We actually started rolling this out yesterday. We've got a series of steps that we want to go through. What does this do for me? Ticks a compliance box. It's not a full assessment. It's the first stage prompt. It's about embedding this. Critically, this engages up skills and equips our staff in the day job. And this actually delivers a fundamental aim of our green plan and getting our system awareness and readiness for new challenges. And last slide, please. Three up, three down. Increase green spaces in nature, increase climate resilience, increase social value, whilst we simultaneously drive down carbon emissions, air pollution and waste. Why? To hit those four elements on the right hand side that Stella's already outlined. That's why we're here. That's why integrated care systems and care boards were, were made. Improvements in population health, tackling inequality, enhancing productivity and value for money and supporting that social and economic development. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. It's been, it's been really helpful seeing how you've got your staff to uh, sort of engage with your SIA. And I see the huge amount of work in planning in 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 in, uh, in getting that off the ground. So it's not it's not something you can just run into. If you really want it to work, you've got to put the effort in. And uh, from from those few slides, you can really see the amount of work you've been doing. So we're looking forward to seeing uh, maybe at a future event how, uh, how that's how that succeeded, how that's landed, and how people have taken ownership of that. Yeah, thank you, right. Terry. Will do. And I'll just say, Terry, um, I do have to leave in a little while, but we will share the SIA for you to circulate to your colleagues as well later in the week. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Alison, over to you. Thank you. There was a question in the chat bar that maybe do, we could perhaps answer in the chat bar rather than uh, take up more time. So I'll share my slides, actually, because I think I've made a few changes, Veronica, if that's all right um, with colleagues. So hopefully you can see that. Um, I'll just put them onto slideshow and then I can move through quite quickly uh, with this. Chris has still got his hands up. I don't know, Terry, if you want to say that or? Yes, Chris. Well, thank you. I was going to put in the chat. I'm Chris oh, right. from the Stroke Associ from the Stroke Association. A uh, so the previous speaker mentioned the supply chain to get to net zero by 2045. When I read uh, delivering a net zero national health service. It appears to say the supply chain has to get to net zero by 2040, and it's the wider emissions, emissions like visitor travel that has to be 2045. Something quite important for us because you know we are, you know, we are part of your supply chain. Perhaps that could be answered in the chat, but yeah. I'm just thinking of your time, Terry. But I'm sure that's the, that sounds like an easy one to answer because it's yeah, a factual Andrew, question. Yeah, Andrew, Andrew, Stella, yeah. or, or Becky. Shall I shall I progress and then they can answer in the chat bar? Is that yep. all right? I'm just thinking of your time, Terry. That's all. So um, just building on the previous speakers, which I, and I think you're going to hear the same over and over again. So I'm I'm the exec director uh, leading our social value network and really interested in colleagues thoughts and ideas about how we can strengthen our network and really make it a force for good and a force for change. What I did want to talk to you briefly about was um, innovation within this whole arena. How do we bring social innovation into the context of decarbonisation? And how do we take this multifaceted goal and trade-offs? And uh, we have a number of trade-offs when we're looking at health and care transformation. So that's that's what I'm just going to cover a, a little bit. Becky will cover this in a minute about our social value centre, which were available for the NHS, local government, industry, and of course, community organisations, voluntary sector. Um, and we aim to be that single point uh, where we look to coordinate some of this fantastic expertise that there is out there and to be really generous with our knowledge. This is not a profit making initiative. This is pure social value in that sense. Uh, obviously, it needs money to keep it going. But really, what we're looking to do is share knowledge and really rapidly look to adopt that knowledge. And we think it's a really much needed initiative. Um, and these are some of the areas we're focusing on in terms of providing that that support, but uh, and recognition of awards, recognition of knowledge and making sure that we've got a strong set of support in that. So just picking up this this aspect of goals. Now, we've talked a little bit about social value measurement, but within the NHS for a long time, we've had a huge number of other measures and goals. And what you measure is what you pay attention to and what you are uh, you know, what you're looked at in terms of um, 
what your, if you like, where you've had additional scrutiny or where you're given the ability and freedoms to uh, innovate, that's where you focus your attention. So this is a very simple summary of the sort of areas that we we have real concrete measures in at the moment. So staff well-being, efficiency, value, clinical quality, and obviously all the population health outcomes. And then our social value lens and the social value framework within which um, uh, colleagues have talked about those five lenses. But I think we can, what we're in danger of is separating these out. And what we need to do is have them as an integrated approach and to ensure that we understand that integrated approach in goal setting and impact. And what's our ambition across all all of that landscape for transformed health and care services, whether we're looking at it from population outcomes, whether we're looking at it from a value lens, quality of care, as well as sustainability and decarbonisation. And we, we need to knit these together so we've got that integrated approach to measurement and goal setting. And then also to have an explicit, transparent uh, approach with decision makers about their unconscious or conscious trade-offs that they're making with between those various goals and how we can reduce those trade-offs and therefore get optimization um, across that landscape of, of different goals that we're, we're all aiming to achieve for our transformation. I'm very uh, taken with the Bevan Commission and what they did is to simplify those those multifaceted goals in terms of waste. So they used waste as a bit of an acronym and then under it you've got all of the dimensions of waste um, and really try to use that as a sort of single message across the system because you can come at this from a population and sustainability lens but you can equally come at it from a waste lens. We are wasting resources in, in terms of an allocative lens as whether an efficiency lens. And so they've used this and please, I've put the link in, you'll get this in a minute. So please have a read of this because the well, uh, Welsh Government are using it um, quite a lot in terms of their, their approach. And what they're doing is taking the Bevan uh, six elements and overlaying it on care pathways. So what they're doing is taking care pathways and overlaying these six domains across those care pathways and then looking at the opportunity. Because whatever door you come through, whether you're passionate about green agenda or whether you're passionate about clinical quality, all of those roads can join together if you take a, a cohesive integrated approach to goal setting and then look at it through the lens of waste and reduction in waste. And um, the second key message in my short presentation is about innovation. So the first is this integrated approach to measurement and goal setting and a single language of waste. The second is innovation and social innovation. And how can we re-energise the NHS? We're still coming out of COVID. We're still going through that. We're still going through recovery. How can we re-energise social innovation to dr really drive new ideas and therefore get a stretch and even more ambition into our transformation plans. And we're very keen on supporting colleagues with this. We've got a playbook on innovation, part of which is our approach to hackathons, which we think is a really good way of actually energising this whole agenda. And if we look at that on the right hand side of here, if you take your direct uh, care model initiatives, we've, we've got, if you take any transformation plan, you've got a massive digital technology adoption. Uh, we've got uh, a large number of workforce um, uh, transformation objectives and integrated team objectives, as well as all the diagnostics, the screening and the changes in the next five years. And we've all got five year transformation plans that ICBs and whole systems are looking at here. How can we take those five year plans and put um, overlay the green and overlay the decarbonisation agenda onto those existing transformation plans? And then how do we stretch them? So how do we take those existing plans and then stretch them even more to say what else can be done to decarbonise these transformation plans? So on the right hand side, I've got an example of the hackathon being used to stretch these initiatives and we can visualise that stretch. Here's a very simple objective. Now we've got what we've invested in is a, um, a set of tools that help you take this multi-goal approach and therefore visualise the impact on by actually innovating and stretching those objectives and going further faster, what's the impact on carbon? So here's a simple one, which is patient initiated follow-ups. That's in every transformation plan you come across. What's the carbon footprint of going further and faster on that? 
uh, which will tick several boxes, but enable you to visualise and get colleagues involvement, commitment and energy around uh, the decarbonisation agenda of just one of those transformation initi initiatives. Here's another one, Cancer Pathway. Um, I've just done an extraction of this because it's quite a long example. Um, but what you've got across the top here is all of those multifaceted objectives and each of them has a language of measurement um, and each of them will be measured. But there's trade offs between those different measures and goals. But how do you use innovation to stretch that decarbonisation impact of this cancer plan? And here we've got an example of um, both the supply chain, but also using advanced analytics, machine learning. What's the impact of these initiatives that we're already thinking about, already working on? What's the carbon footprint impact of those? So I'm very interested in taking a transformation plans, taking the the pathways and the programs and overlaying the carbon footprint on those and then stretching that through uh, social innovation to really look at, you know, what's the opportunity beyond that that we can look at. But within that, and I'll just finish here, is, is just to recognise it's not all positives. There are trade offs here um, and we need to overtly recognise the disbenefits. So digital is an obvious one where the more that we roll out digital tools for patients and our staff, Potentially, you've got some real upticks on value efficiency reduction in waste, but there are downsides potentially here in terms of vulnerable groups, disabled, um, who may not be able to uptake those digital tools and our own staff resilience and well-being in terms of their um, higher throughput and issues there in terms of their own well-being. So we need to recognise those and actually actively put mitigation plans in place to make sure we don't have unintended consequences of that. So I've just taken that as an example where there's a risk in terms of staff well-being of, of digital tools because they're working harder, they've got less travel times, less time in the car and that may be positive. Uh, but equally, we probably are actually looking for higher productivity. So we need to look at our supportive policies on flexible working, how we actually make sure we've got green travel benefits as well as car schemes. And we need to also protect capacity to support the vulnerable, the old, with, with making sure we've still got those face-to-face -face capacity, that carer support, telephone support, and not just assume that digital tools um, can be a positive thing for all, because obviously there are exclusions um, and we could actually make make things worse for particular populations. So that's it from me, Terry. And I think hopefully that leads on nicely to Becky to talk more about the social value um, service that we have. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alison. You brought us back on time as well. So that's, that's great. So and thanks. That, uh, that looking at that whole system approach again, I think we're getting a common theme here. And uh, and also recognize being honest and recognizing the trade offs, I think, is 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 helpful. And um, I'm making the point this shouldn't be an additional task. It needs to build on what we're currently doing. And we do need to look to see how we can stretch ourselves by overlaying those Bevan principles across the uh, across our, our existing transformation plan. So, yes, thanks. Thanks very much, Alison. Becky. Thanks, Terry. Um, hi everybody, so I'm uh, Becky Jones and I'm a um, social value specialist for Arden and Gem and I'm just going to talk a little bit more about social value, how it sort of aligns with sustainability and how um, we can help um, with your approach. So next slide please. So just the Andrew showed these earlier on as well, but I think it's really important when we're talking about social value to understand what exactly is social value. So handily, there is no one single definition. So what we use when we think about social value is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So you can see them on the screen there, the 17. And if we achieve all of these, then we will live in a fair and equitable world. Well, these are the 2030 Agenda Goals, and these are um, an upgrade, if you like, from the Millennium Development Goals. So we're doing a good job at redefining and not doing a good job of achieving the goals. So I think it's just really important to understand that. And when we think about social value, um, we think about it from uh, an economic, an environmental and a social perspective. And that comes through the Social Value Act, which came in in 2012. So what's really important to do is when you're considering how you're going to do this from as an individual or from an organisational perspective, it's important to understand what does social value mean to me, to us, and how are we going to achieve that? Next slide, please. So from an Arden and Gem perspective, we've done just that. 
So we define social value to us as increasing the benefits for our employees and customers from a social, economic and environmental perspective. It's about being a growth enabler with a focus on reducing health inequalities. And it's also about growing capabilities within our customers across our organisation to deliver improved social value. So basically doing everything we can to increase our social value and helping customers and other organisations to do exactly the same. So we've done that with a series of pledges and some KVIs, so key value indicators, so that we can deliver on our our pledges so across these six different themes here next slide please so i just wanted to talk a little bit about ppn 0620 so policy procurement no 0620 and policy procurement no 0621 i think this is kind of the right time to look at that because the way that the nhs views social value in my opinion is not um it's not the correct position for it to be in because by placing it in procurement what you're doing is you're placing it at the very end of the process so that what I've just explained about understanding social value what does it mean to us how are we going to then embed it and deliver it if you stick it at the end as Andrew was talking about before it becomes that bolt on it becomes that add on it's something that people don't really think about it makes it really transactional it makes it a tick box exercise it's all the things that we've talked about that you shouldn't do this is exactly what half what we've done by putting it at the very end of the process and what it also means is when you're working as a system, which is what we're trying to do, it makes it really difficult to work with other organisations because local authorities and the VCFSE sector define social value differently. So they define at the start. So if you're trying to come up with a system approach, which is what we need to get to, we're stopping ourselves by using um, PPN 0620 at the very end of the process. And it's the same for PPN 0621, which is about the carbon reduction plan. So again, as Ella said, it's not just about carbon. So we've helpfully made something about carbon and stuck it at the very end of a process. So again, it just it doesn't give that same message about that circular um, model that we've been talking about. It also doesn't re uh, relate to primary care. So that's a big chunk of colleagues that aren't involved in it. Again, it's stuck at the very end of the process. It's that focus on carbon and it just creates a real unequal playing field because we're all coming at things from different perspectives. So I just sort of wanted to pick up on that. Uh, next slide, please. So this kind of is a conversation about green and looking at things through the green lens. And I just wanted to say why, you know, it's really important that we do consider social value as a part of that process. You know, sustainability isn't just green. So we talked about the Social Value Act. If we want to properly and truly achieve what we need to under the ICS, under the fourth pillar of the ICS, which is to help the NHS support broader social and economic development, we're not going to do that unless we look at social value and how we can increase our social value. It also directly aligns to green plans. I've had the joy of writing lots of green plans and every single one of those plans had a section on social value because it's really important that we have that linkage at the very beginning. It also, if we want to get to delivering the 10% the prevention as in the Hewitt review, which is really important and the, the whole thing kind of what I'm talking about is sustainability in terms of longevity of public services. If we don't make these changes, we won't have public services. So we won't be sitting here discussing things because they just won't exist. So we need to think, how do we get to prevention? And so it, it, we need to think about social value. It needs to be involved in our joint forward plan so we can demonstrate what are we going to do as a system to make sure that we can do this. And social value is one of those things that it can be a bit, you know, airy fairy, kind of a bit out there. And no one's quite sure what to talk about. But actually, for social value to be really effective, you have to have really visible and high level leadership buy in in order to make it work. So actually, it's a very senior level and it's a very important topic that has to have that senior level buy in. So it's a complete opposite, actually, in order for, for execs to be able to deliver on what they need to deliver on. They need to be visibly showing that they're doing this work. So I think it's just important to maybe look at it from that perspective. I've talked about PPN 0620, 0621, but what I'm going to do now is talk about some of the key things which are really impacting on our public services and how social value, I think, can help them. So poverty, housing, the collapsing public services, and then just what we need to do for the long term sustainability. So could I have the, the next slide, please? Thank you. So poverty and health inequalities, really, really important issues that we need to talk about if we want to consider how are we going to have services in the future. And some of the figures are quite stark. And the reason why I've got lots of words is because I'm not really, I don't remember numbers and figures and stuff. So I had to keep them on the screen because so, I wouldn't remember them. But when we think about poverty, 
you know, it's relative po poverty in the UK, but the poverty gap has grown massively over recent years. And for a, for a household to be considered to be below the poverty line, you've got to have 60%, less than 60% of the average household income. So if you look at that in terms of real people, if you're a couple with two children under 14 and you're living in poverty, what that means is in order just to get to the poverty line, you're going to have to earn an extra £6,200 a year. Now, in the 90s, that was 3,300, so it's doubled in that time. And over 6 million people in this country are living in destitution. Now, destitution is something where you can't afford essentials. So if you can't afford two essentials in one, so you can't afford to pay for your house, you can't afford food, you can't afford lighting, you can't afford shoes, things like that. So 6 million people in the UK are living in destitution. And in order for them to get to the poverty line, they would need to in increase their salary by nearly 13 grand a year. So can I have the next slide, please? Now, just looking at the issues here, one in five people in the UK were in poverty in 21, 22. That's about 14 and a half million people. And what's really, really important is that two thirds of those were in working households. So this is a real issue that work isn't paying. And so but this is something we really need to look at as a, as a society because people are going to work and it's not paying to go to work. So the number of children that are in poverty is rising. The number of pensioners in poverty is rising. So say two in 10 adults are in poverty, three in 10 children are in poverty. So we are creating these cycles of generational poverty, which is putting more and more pressure on our services, which is then meaning that our services aren't going to be around in order to be able to help people because of the society that we're creating. Next slide, please. So Professor Sir Michael Marmot on this last month, he said, Britain has become a grim place to live with people experiencing Victoria era diseases such as malnutrition, rickets and scurvy, similar to those experienced on long sea voyages due to lack of fresh veg. So universal credit pays about 70% of the required costs. So those on universal credit and benefits can therefore expect to be ill because they can't eat sensibly, they can't heat their homes and they can't afford other essentials. This is 2024 and this is the position that we're in. We're back in Victorian era Britain. And what we need to do is reduce the pressure on our services so that our services are able to deal with the people that most need it. And in fact, we're doing the complete opposite. We're imploding on ourselves. We're not paying people properly. We're not having proper houses. We're not having proper like, the poverty of aspiration is everywhere because people can't get out of this slide of a society that we've created. And this is why social value matters. And this is why it's inherently linked to sustainability because until we can increase social value, there will be no sustainability because there won't be any services. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on to housing. So we know about 28 to 32,000 people a year die because of poor air quality, and that's internal as well as external. And we know it costs about 50 grand to treat someone for pneumonia. So why then have them in hospital and send them back to a house that's full of mould? It just doesn't make sense, but this is what we're doing. And I just thought this was an interesting quote by Lalitha uh, Try from the Resolution Foundation. And she said, the UK is blighted by two housing crises. High housing costs are causing many renters in particular to fall behind on housing payments, while poor quality housing is leaving millions of people having to deal with damp and malfunctioning heating, plumbing and electrics. High costs and poor housing quality can make life miserable for poor people, can damage both their personal finances and their wider health. In other words, this is impacting on every part of an individual's life and it's putting more and more pressure onto public services. So if we can go back if we can increase the social value, if we can reduce health inequalities, if we can build up the communities so people can help themselves, that is what we need to do to reduce pressure on services and have more sustainable services in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And so just to carry on in the, the, the joyousness of, <laughs> of this, it does get better, don't worry. Um, but just to look at like the crumbling public services, um, so if you look at the, uh, the chief exec of the British Association of Social Workers, she says there's much more inequality, many more people proportionally living in poverty and relative poverty and even destitution. 
those circumstances on families create those circumstances are stresses on families and create need of all kinds the relationship between poverty and demand on services cannot be missed let's look at dentists we can we know we're near the terminal decline with nhs dentists six million fewer courses of nhs dental treatment last year over 500 million pounds lower in real terms uh, in terms of funding from 2014 and um, it's nigh impossible to get a dentist if you look at teachers, nearly 40,000 teachers left the teaching profession for reasons other than retirement um, in 21-22. That's nearly 9% of the total workforce and the highest since records began back in 2010. And the NHS, 170,000 workers left the NHS in 2022. This is just unsustainable. So we've got more and more people needing services, more and more people leaving the provision to be able to provide those services. And I think this at the bottom here, this quote, when people live in a fair, caring society where everyone has equal access to social goods, they don't have to spend their time worrying about how to cover their basic needs day to day. They can enjoy the art of living. And instead of feeling that they're in co constant competition with their neighbours, they can build bonds of social solidarity. And I think that's where we need to be. We need to be where we are building bonds of social solidarity and we are helping each other. Uh, next slide, please. And that's why, if I take you right back to what I said about Arjun and Gemma at the very beginning, our focus for our social value is to increase our social value and to help others increase their social value. So at the end of the day, what we've got is stronger communities, stronger individuals who can help themselves and less reliance on the public sector. Uh, so what we've got here is a whole list of things from, in terms of different um, offers of support that we've created um, in Arden and Gem. So you can see them on here, but if I can just go to the next slide, I can talk you through each one. Um, my, so my slides don't seem to have come across very well, so they're all a bit random, but, <laughs> but apologies about that, but the, the intent is the same. Um, so from the network, we've, we've, we've created the social value network and we've invested in this. And what this does is it's a way of bringing people together to have like a best practice communities so we can share information, we can share learning, we can just work together so that we can as, as a as a public sector and working with suppliers uh, as well is just to really say this is what social value is this is how we can work together so we can share it all so instead of doing it you know 42 times across each different ICS let's share together and let's work collectively to make the lives better for the people uh, whom, whom we serve um, next slide please okay so this is just a little bit about the social value network that we've got and um, there's all kinds of stuff on there to help in terms of your social value journey. So whether you're at the very beginning, whether you'll want to work as an organisation or whether you're in a position where you've done quite a lot already and you want to move to the next phase, which is working as a whole system. And when I talk about whole systems, I include voluntary sector in there because I think it's really important that the voluntary sector are, are at the table of the of the ICS as well. Uh, next slide, please. And it's all really safe. We've got the vault, so everything that you've got in there can be put in the vault so you can work up all your information. It belongs to you and you can build your approach for social value in your area. Uh, next slide, please. We've got um, a social value advisory board. So this is made up of people from all different sectors. So NHS, local authorities, voluntary sector, housing association, private sector. And there's all people who can come at social value from a different perspective and are able to provide their help and guidance um, to help you um, in your specific um, approach to social value. Uh, next slide, please. And this is um, our free site. So I think Chris has already put the link up to that. So this is just something there that's there as a go to um, sort of has some hints and tips on things that are already there for social value. Um, I think we've actually now got about 271 people registered. I think the last time I, I looked at this, so um, it's increasing. So it's on there. Have a look and, and log in. That'll be great. Um, next slide, please. I just want to talk a little bit about the Social Value Quality Mark um, in Health Awards. So this is the first, as far as we're aware, the first specific um, award for social value in health. Uh, we launched it last year. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So this, what this is doing is, I say lots of organisations are probably doing something. Everyone knows they need to do something, so they're kind of trying to, to, to do their best. But what this does is it provides a framework and it's a visible sort of external validation that this organisation is tackling health inequalities. It's driving fairness and inclusion and supporting a healthier, healthier and happier workforce. And this is like an external validation of that. And next slide, please. Thank you. So 
so we've got the bond it's all on there we can get all the information out to you but this is a, again it's just a really good way of saying as an organization we are committed to increasing our social value and then externally this is a validation that we are doing this and it's just a way it's a process and a framework to help you deal with all of the stuff like what do i do how do i do it this gives you that that um that clear approach next slide please thank you so and i'm sorry about my slides they don't look like that on my screen um so we've got some consultancy support as well so we can help you at whatever um, stage of your um, process you're in. Uh, we can help you with the quality mark. We can help you all of um, all of the different um, documents and we can help you put it on the network so it's all completely secured and uh, you've got all of those links with everybody else. But what this does is this directly um, helps to reduce health inequalities. It helps to reducing the pressure on services. And this is something we can absolutely make happen if we just come together. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And so just finally, you know, we've done a lot of talking, but, you know, we, what we need to do now is action. We've got a responsibility to bring about change. And, you know, people are dying today because they're cold and hungry. Public services are on their knees because we can't cope with the fallout of what's happening. So we need to focus. We need to look at prevention. We need to work with our local communities to strengthen them, to give people the autonomy to, to look after themselves, to be themselves, to help themselves, to have a voice and stand up for themselves. We need people to help each other to work together. And it's not too late, but we are running out of time. So what we need to do is come together and start to reverse the decline. And if we focus on increasing social value, reducing health inequalities, then we can support the longevity of the public services and they can be there and we can work together to achieve that. Thank you and apologies again for my random slides. <laughs> no, thank, thank you, Becky. It's brilliant. I think uh, we've had four really impassioned speakers there. So I'm, I'm really, uh, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Really great event. And uh, I, th I think, Alison, you've made a comment about make, uh, making absolutely sure certain we, we uh, package this up and, and share it more widely because I think, um, uh, Beck, in your in your sort of bleak summary there, I think you just highlighted to us all. I think the the reason why we're in this job, the reason you know what we're here to do. So, and I love that uh, it's not just about getting in, getting rid of inequalities. It is about um, enjoying the art of living. I mean, some some of the uh, some of the situations you described there are, are awful, and I think that's why you know why we why we join public services. So, yeah, it's really really helpful reminder. Uh, on that note. Um, You've, your speakers not only been very impassioned, they've been very timely, so thank you. Uh, it means we've got plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. Now, I've seen quite a lot going in the chat box, but is anybody wants to open up open up debate now in the last, last 20 minutes? We stunned everybody to silence, Terry. I think, which I think is so. not sure. I'm not sure that's. Um, <laughs> um, I guess I was going to say, you know, obviously I've spoken and I, Becky and Andrew and I, we get together frequently. And Alison, your your talk as well was, you know, I think that that deck is really in, in, impactful and powerful. I think for me, it's about making sure we keep all of that very high profile when we're doing our day job, and that's really tricky, isn't it? When kind of the business as usual, the way that the system is designed isn't designed to kick out the most fairest most sustainable kind of healthcare housing you know the whole the whole picture isn't necessarily designed to give us the outcome we want so i guess really for me it's just sort of saying you kind of have to have that courage and that tenacity to want to swim upstream and make a difference and for the sustainability colleagues that you know i talk to often frequently i think we all have those days where we feel like we could take on the world we feel like we're championing a cause and I guess that's probably how a lot of people feel in the NHS in their job, that you have good days where you really feel like, yeah, we can make a difference, really important. And then you have days where you just feel completely beaten down by the challenges in the system. And it's just really about how do we support each other as well to keep that fight. Chris. Hi, right, Chris Lennon. I'm, I don't know, work with Stella quite a lot, actually. I work for Cambridge Community Services. Um, what we're finding is it's actually really expensive to do the right thing. <laughs> you know, the bottom line is it, it costs more to be green. So that's unfortunately it's not right. But um, yeah, it's 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 so not just only have you got the kind of the mental attitude and the 
and, and it bleats and all the rest of it to, to, to sometimes you have to battle against them not always but it's actually the money to be allow you to do it just put my five penneth worth in that <laughs> uh uh, thanks. Yes, uh, uh, Evan, Evan Grant. Oh, Evan, Evan sorry. Yeah, yeah no, no, no problem. No problem. <laughs> Stalling for time, get the camera. Yeah, uh, uh, I think perhaps one of the reasons it's more expensive is because we're stuck in this tick box exercise of doing it at the end. And one of the things that I find as a continuing frustration, as you say, I work with the voluntary sector, mental health and wellbeing in the Birmingham and Solihull ICS. And one of the enduring frustrations is that we can have a conversation like this and everybody knows that to improve overall population health, to reduce inequalities, to make things more sustainable, we have to really transform what we do for prevention. But because, because there's such a huge cost of transforming from where we are now to doing things for its prevention first, we, we just end up getting stuck with incremental change in what we do already. And, and so much of the carbon and the costs and everything is locked into how we've done things for uh, 50, 70 years. Uh, I, I despair because I don't see the signs of a, a really transformation approach that leads with prevention and has everything falling on from that. I recognise that to get from here to there, there, there is a big uh, cost of change, which we don't have any means of funding. But if we don't really get geared around prevention first, I don't see how uh, I think the rest of it is just making uh, very worthy improvements to what we've got, but we can never we can never make enough of these uh, incremental changes to get where we need to go. Anyway, that's my two pence worth. Thank you. It's helpful. Uh, uh, Eleanor. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I can't. I haven't got a camera on this uh, uh, PC. Uh, I'm a paediatrician um, and leave the sustainability in, um, uh, near, in in the Midlands in, in Nottinghamshire. Um, I, I think you're right. We're forced into make trying to make incremental change because the budgetary system is 12 months. And of course, what we're talking about with social value and improving public health and prevention are long term uh, plans um, and, and it's very difficult to write those in. And I, I think we need collectively to uh, persuade people that long term financial planning will pay off because, um, uh, you know, I, I, for me, that's the only way we can make any of these big things happen. We will get financial rewards and it will become cheaper ultimately, but not just yet. Um, and I don't know how who makes that um, plea um, and or how we do it collectively. But for me, that's the thing that needs to happen. I I think I think linked to that, I think it's something about what Alison said is is it's about not trying to it will be cost if we just keep seeing this as a completely separate exercise. It is about building on what you've already got. I know in East of England, um your meds management people have been trying for well for de well very successfully, I think, for decades in uh, in getting trying to get clinicians to switch switch drugs for, for price reasons. Uh but ac actually um uh, that can be quite difficult sometimes. People get fed up, we'll keep switching them over. They say it's the cheapest today, and then tomorrow you're going to tell me to change again. But when you start bringing in the um, the environmental issues, the CFCs and things like that, and, ha well, and containing some of the drugs, that actually can turbocharge some of these change because people then see it as saving the planet as well as saving money. And I think so sometimes you can uh, you can actually uh, accelerate some of that change by building on your 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 existing plan. So I think that I think putting that um, that, that template that uh, we were talking about, the, like the Bevan principles, that over what you've already overlaying that across what you're already doing, I think can help to accelerate some of that change rather than trying to come forward with the in the in the in the in the financial cycle of just another another plan that's going to cost some money and it joins the, it joins the list is actually say, well, actually, I think I can help you deliver the plan you've already got and uh, improve social value and improve the environment and it, it, it improve population health. So I think there's it's about it's being clever, I think, being clever about how we we link it with those plans that are already there. I just I'd tell you if I can just jump jump in and I think um getting other voices to speak on our behalf as a sort of force for change is really key. Uh I think a colleague said, you know, it costs more to be green. And I think we've got to change that language really because it is about waste. Um and finance directors, medical directors speaking on this topic, actually about uh, good governance, good stewardship of our taxpayers resource 
it actually is all aligned, isn't it? But I think we do have a different different times time frame for the benefits to be shown. And what we need to show is that we can release and reinvest for the benefit of the planet and for people and, and our communities in a short term as well as the long term. But the long term does probably because you are going to talk about investment in the long term as well, because you've got to change things. But we, if we can show that short term um, annual and th two, three year sort of, you know, release and reduction in waste, I think it will help with that longer term investment case. Sorry, Chris. Sorry, me again. Just another segue on, on, on the waste side of it. If we look at the new HTM, or it's not that new now, on from NHS on waste in the 2020-60 segregation of clinical waste, um, there's a couple of elements to that which all organisations should be able to realise savings quite quickly in the sense that you're going to get your financial savings by moving your waste stream down to the lowest possible um, level possible lowest level of segregation possible but also because you're treating waste at the more waste at the lower level of segregation the amount of carbon uh, the carbon cost for treating that waste is also going to be significantly lower so you're going to save costs and you're going to save carbon as well if you can then not package your goods or distribute the goods in in, in, a, in a way that is wasteful in the first place that so that's supply chain and procurement stuff we should be on on, on a winner with some of this pure i'm talking about waste in its purest sense uh, relatively quickly as both as individual organizations systems and, and countrywide ella i'll just offer another thought as well really i'm not sure i've got the solution wholly to it but i think you know, one of the challenges is around uh, how we embed it really, isn't it? So that's really what we've talked about. You know, when we look at NHS long term plan and ambitions, sustainable healthcare, when you look particularly again at those four core purposes of an ICB, does lean in and have a part to play in almost every care pathway. You know, if you're looking at obesity and you're looking at active travel and you're looking at diets, you know, when you look when you when you begin to think about how do we weave the green agenda into every agenda that's already there and and uh you know for me riding the priorities that people are already feeling the pressure of and responding to rather than trying to introduce another ask or priority is part of the the trick of the framing and i think it's 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 unfortunate that in a way we're a bit obsessed as, with, with nhs with kind of programs projects and initiatives and the fact that we're called the greener program for, for me it ca causes me a lot of you know sleepless nights because it's not a program it is just a way of working um and i think that's how we've got to kind of frame it that sustainability is about resilience and efficiency and effectiveness and longevity it's not it's not you know it's not kind of the new show in town so i think that for me is one of the takeaways really terry how, how and i think alison's point in the, the chat about how do we then use the advocates and the voices of those other particular strands to help us kind of frame that and it be part of everyday language not we've got kind of targets just for net zero and we have governance structures just for that and we have to you know kind of activity it's really about how does this play into just how we do business i mean we've got huge issues in our supply chain lots of products that we struggle uh you know to to, to source i mean that's a, that's a sustainability issue in it in itself uh you begin to overlay the impact of climate change on whether or not all of those kind of areas that we're pulling those products from will still be around what that does to the you know the workforce there are huge things that we need to be factoring in that just are part of business as usual so i think changing the language and changing the lens are the key bits for me that's help, yeah, helpful i think becky Thanks, Terry. I think it comes down to how do we define value as well. So is value financial or is value reducing emissions, is value and saving lives? I think that's the conversation because there's someone talked before about the finance directors, you know, I was looking at the bottom right hand corner. But if we can redefine value, so saving lives, reducing health inequalities is just as relevant as the financial elements. I think that's the kind of conversation because if there's a step, if we can... In the, in the secondary care, it's 492 million. We could have a 100% shift to LED lighting. 
which would pay for itself in a 3.7 year period and would save £3 billion over the next three decades. So that's something that we can, if we can redefine value to something like that, that's how we can start to, to change it. And I'm not saying we've got a spare 500 million quid lying around, but it's having those kind of conversations because that would save money in the long term, that would save lives. And that's what we need to do is redefine value. And how do we want value to, what do we want value to be in the future? And I'm just going to add another thought to that, Becky. Sorry, Terry, just jump in there. I did mention earlier on in my presentation about the emissions trading scheme. But the other thing to keep and to bear in mind is that there is a national policy to move us in this direction. And uh, a lot of that will begin to create financial levers and penalties where we don't meet that net zero. It's like at the moment we're sort of competing with a um, can we invest in more sustainable health care? Like the option is to not to not do anything at all. But actually, not only will that have a health impact if we don't lean into this, but we will see more of those kind of financial penalties like the emissions trading scheme, where eventually our hospital trusts are paying more and more to uh, because they've not met those expectations. And that cost will then will come out of the system. So I think there's also, a, you know, a, having a, having one eye on the where is the national policy directive and 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 they are wanting us to move in that in that way. No, absolutely. I think I think also um, Andrew, Andrew's presentation, I think it was really key as well that we've got to engage the, with the decision makers, we're all decision makers in our organisations, and it's having a, an understanding of the impact of those decisions on, on this agenda and, uh, and, and, and how we can possibly make a difference because we haven't got the we haven't got the answers here. So we have we have to get that, that we have to get those impassioned um, messages to, to those who are who are making those decisions and, and also have those solutions some of the solutions that we haven't even thought of yet so it's uh so I'm, i'll be really interested to see how how successful andrew's uh engagement program is going to be and, whether, and what lessons can be learned from that going forward um if there's no more questions i was going to i was going to probably give you a, a few more minutes of your time back and uh and also just to just to let you know that we're going to we're going to uh, send you a, um, a sort of feedback questionnaire just so we can build on build on this event and uh, and hopefully uh, help plan future events which um, which which add value which which uh, which which you want to come to. I think the fact that we had I think at one stage I saw nearly eighty people on this call. So there's a there's a there's a, obviously a huge demand for these sorts of events and uh, and learning and uh, and and this i think we need to build on that we need to build those networks so uh, uh, one other please becky i think you said your um, social value things already got 250 members in there it'd be great if we can sort of double triple quadruple that and start to to build that network out, up over the next the next few months to start learning from each other because uh, none of us have got all the answers to this so the the more the more we can network the more we can work together the more we can we can achieve Right. On that note of it, just a big, a big thank you. Big thank you to you all and especially to the speakers as well. It's been, been a really, really thought provoking event. Thank you. Thanks, Terry.